Hi everyone. We continue our endeavor and we will proceed with the Monte Carlo simulations for finding out the value of pi. So the very primitive or the very simple way of doing it <coughs> is as follows. So you have a square and a circle which is inscribed in it all right well <laughs> i can draw them properly so let me do that all right you get the point so you have something like this yeah so then the the point is you sort of choose a point randomly in in uh, you choose a pair of points x comma y in the square okay so suppose you choose this point you choose this point you randomly sample a whole bunch of points so you have x0 y0 x1 y1 x2 y2 and then you have maybe n such samples x n y n right so then for each point what we would want to know is whether that point lies inside the circle or not so the probability that a point lies inside is equal to the number of points inside the circle so if i call that a small n divided by the total number of points and this probability will be equal to the ratio of the area of the circle to the area of this square so if this radius is equal to 1 then n by n becomes equal to pi upon so if this radius is 1 this diameter becomes equal to 2 so the square area is 4 all right so if we choose a large number of points all right so the number of samples are large and the choice of x and y are sampled from a uniform distribution okay so x and y are sampled between or rather we can write it like this x comma y belongs to minus one to one okay so let us go to our computer and do this so let me copy this snippet we'll require it as usual so let me run it then I will have a large number of points sampled between minus one to one okay so I will do I will I will do the following I will say v equal to np dot random dot uniform and I will sample it from minus one to one and I will declare the size equal to n rows and two columns where I will define what n is all right so I will define n equal to 1000 okay no problem once I have v so what is v so it has n rows and two columns okay so these will be the x values and these will be the y values so let me splice the array v to assign them to x and y so x equal to v all rows of the first column and y equal to v all rows of the second column all right 
so now that we have all these x and y's what we'll do is we'll try to plot these pairs of points uh, okay so plt dot plot x comma y and we'll put them as markers and we'll reduce the marker size we'll make it one all right let us see what what we have we will set the aspect ratio to one because we'd like the aspect ratio of the plot to be correct all right okay so this is what we have so these are all the points that we have sampled randomly but uniformly between so minus one and one all right so um, let me draw the square let me draw the square so the x coordinates will be starting from minus one 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 minus one comma minus one the y coordinates will be minus one minus one 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 minus one and we will use a black line so that's the square we'll also plot the circle so okay so in order to plot the circle with the radius one okay so we can do the following we can define theta is equal to np dot length space 0 to 2 times pi let me take 100 values and we'll do plt dot plot so the radius is 1 so the x coordinates will be r cos theta that is cos theta so np dot cos of theta np dot sign of theta and we'll make it as a red circle all right so now the question is <clears throat> whether or we, we want to find out how many points that we have randomly sampled or rather uniformly sampled between minus one and one for both x and y how many of those points lie inside the circle out of the total number of points sampled okay so uh, let's do that so once we've plotted this we can create an array r so r will be equal to simply x square plus y square now ideally r will be x square plus y square and this is to 0.5 but because we're gonna check it against one the radius is going to be one we can drop this to save on one set of calculation we can drop the square root so now r is this and we are concerned with all those sort of index of r which are less than one okay so and true will be r less than one and we will typecast it as int meaning so the meaning of this line is mm, well I'll, I'll print it and show you i think it's much easier if i print it and show you so let me run this let me show you what r is in fact let me reduce the number of samples to 10 so then showing it is much easy so r is this now let me show you what nt is so let me print r print 
20 so now look it is greater than 1 so it is 0 it is less than 1 so it is 1 less than 1 1 and so on so I now have an array which gives me the boolean whether something is greater than 1 or less than 1 that is something is inside the circle or outside the circle now how many occurrences of that particular conditional do I have this particular conditional how many occurrences do I have I will simply sum all the indexes of NT so this will be NP dot sum of this so that will give me all the instances where the radius is less than 1 okay and so now the probability this particular probability is equal to n upon capital n so let me define p is n t upon number of samples so now i have an estimate of pi so pi estimate is equal to four times this probability and then i'll simply print pi est or in fact i can do the following pi estimate percentage f slash t error is equal to percentage f and i will print over here pi est in fact let me make this estimated pi and i will do this comma np dot abs of np dot pi minus pi est okay so let me run this uh, so pi is uh, this has to be p okay so obviously when the number of samples are quite low there will be a very large error now what we need to do is increase the number of samples and we see that the error is decreasing so now let me increase this further so the error becomes even smaller so let us do one thing let us okay it's still running it takes a while okay so the, the plotting took a bit of bit of time but the, the fact that the whole rectangle is almost black means you have uniformly sampled a lot of points over this entire space okay so uh, in fact let me reduce this and so the plotting takes a bit of time so in fact let me ditch the plots we don't need to really plot on this because we are convinced that it works okay so we don't need this theta business also so this is the entirety of the code in the <clears throat> and the code otherwise runs quite fast plotting seems to create a bit of time delay so what we want to do is so we know that the more we sample points in space the better this estimate will be all right so against n how does that pi estimate converge or rather pi estimate minus pi this this error how does it converge does it converge like this or like this or like this so what is the nature of convergence as we increase n all right so let's let's do that let's let me remove this in fact let me take let me put it in a different cell let me remove this all right so let me define n a as n p so i have created a log space between one and six i've taken 80 points in that and i've declared the type of the log space as int because when we declare a log space it is 10 to the power something right so it is 10 to the power 1 all the way to 10 to the power 6 and we are taking 80 points 
we are casting it to a type int so then we'll wrap everything inside this for n in n a and then we'll indent all of this because it's supposed to be inside the for loop and what we will do is we'll do a plot plt dot plot so on the x-axis we will put n and on the y-axis we'll put this error okay so and we will put it down as as this all right so let me get rid of this print statement as well so let us see okay there's an error let's see okay ah. Ah, so obviously I need to take a log of both the axis so I'll just do that and we got log 10 p dot log 10 and the thing is because uh, it's going across such a large range it's going from 10 to the power 1 all the way to 10 to the power 6 so I need to sort of take a log and represent it in a log scale okay so let me run this oh it looks something nice so it does seem that there is some sort of convergence as n increases so I don't want to push this further maybe I can go to 10 to the power 7 as well on my machine I don't want to go beyond that okay there might be some issues that may occur so <clears throat> let us see what kind of curve we can fit over here so let me do this mm it's going from 1 to 7 right so let me do this x equal to np dot lin space 1 to 7 and i'll do a plot x comma mm, minus 1 upon 2 times x and i'll put down a red line so let me run this oops this is plt dot plot all right so i have fitted this against x uh, minus half of x meaning so let's let's analyze what is going on so on the x-axis you have log n and on the y-axis you have <coughs> log of the magnitude of pi minus pi estimate and it appears to fit quite well to this particular line which has a slope of minus half so a slope of minus half means the log of the error the absolute error is minus half times log of n and this is n to the power minus half okay so the error goes down as 1 by n to the power half as n increases the error reduces according to this power law okay so this gives us a way of estimating the value of pi by sort of creating a bunch of states okay what's really happening is <clears throat> we're creating a whole large number of states so The next problem that I want to discuss is that of the Poupon needle. So imagine you have a bunch of parallel lines and the distance between each line is A and you have needle of length b right so then you throw this needle randomly on this 
explored. So then, what is the probability that the needle crosses a line? That is the question. So, if a needle is something like this, it is not crossing the line. Whereas, if the needle is something like this, it is crossing the line. It could be, uh, it could have any orientation. It need not be like this. It could be something like this and so on. So, that is the basic question. So, now, the idea is to write down the distance between the midpoint of this needle and the closest it is to this parallel line. So if I call this distance as y, so if y is larger than or rather if y is less than the projection of this length, so this is the midpoint. So if y is less than b by 2 times sine theta. So this angle is theta. So let me enlarge the figure. So this is the midpoint. This distance is y. This distance is b by 2. This distance is going to be b by 2 sine theta. So if y is less than b by 2 sine theta, then the needle will intersect. Right? So now what can be the prospective values of y and theta? So obviously theta can go all the way from so it can go all the way from 0 to pi right it can take all orientations from 0 to pi whereas y can take all values from so this midpoint can be directly on the line so it can be 0 to the worst case, it can be at the midpoint between these two lines. Okay, and it's symmetric in in the y direction. So it can go all the way from zero to a by two. So if you just think about it, this is what you will get. In fact, you can also do the following. It, it, you can go from zero to pi by two, but then you'll have to sample y. From minus a by 2 to a by 2. But anyway, we don't want to uh, discuss this too much and we want to get to the numerics of it. So, so then finally, the condition that we have obtained is this. So now let, let us focus on this condition. So let, let us sample. R1 between 0 and 1 so that y can be a by 2 times R1. Similarly, theta can be sampled between so let R2 be also another sample drawn uniformly between 0 and 1. So, so this theta will be will be simply pi times r2 so now if r1 is less than b upon a times sine of pi r2 then we say that intersection has occurred Otherwise, intersection has not occurred. Right? So, let us encode this. It's not at all difficult to encode. And in fact, we can 
reuse this program. So let me, yeah, so instead of sampling from minus one to one, we'll sample from zero to one. And we will make this as R1, we will make this as R2, and we will multiply it by A by two, and we will multiply this by five. All right, so then we would check. Ah, in fact, R1 and R2 are just sampled between zero and one. They are not multiplied by this because we have obtained the inequality in terms of the random numbers R1 and R2 rather than something else. So let me fix this. So now that we have this, we can write down the inequality. So we can write E is equal to R1 minus E upon A times E of sine R2 times pi. And then we will find out when e is less than zero, then find out all, all the values, uh, find out the sum of all the values, and then the probability is this. Well, the estimate for pi will be something else. For now, we will simply plot. Well, in this particular problem, we can show analytically that when b by a is less than one then the probability that is number of samples which intersect upon total number of samples that will be something like not something like it will be 2b by pi so the estimate for pi is to be 2b by pa where p is this probability So let us encode that information. So let me write down y estimate will be equal to 2 into b upon p into a. All right. So let me reduce this. Let me define what p and a will be. Like. So let b be 0 0.6, let a be 1. So let me run this. Okay, there's an error. R2 is not different after that. It's actually R2. Okay, let me run this. Okay, we do have convergence once again as n increases through the Buffon Idol experiment as well. So we have done two Monte Carlo simulations. So why is this again? Why is this also a Monte Carlo simulation? Because you are generating states. You are not going through the evolution of the needle as it is bouncing around. You are generating a state for the needle and you are checking a certain condition against that state. Okay, so you generate states, you check the states, and then you perform the statistics. And that is pretty much Monte Carlo in a nutshell. And for those of who, those of you who know that geography, Monte Carlo is a scenic region to the south of France, and it is known for its casinos and gambling. And so the fact that you are using a technique which draws random, which which makes random states, it it sort of resembles sort of a gambling process going on not a gambling process but a draw of cards if you may okay you're drawing states just like you would do in a casino and that is why it's called as monte carlo this is just a quick one line history of it but yeah i mean this can be a very powerful method of um, achieving a lot of things in fact monte carlo simulations are often used to 
minimize energy of various molecular systems because you can generate a whole bunch of state space like positions and you can generate a whole lot of velocities and you can check whether that particular state that you've generated whether that has a certain energy threshold if it's lower than a threshold then you accept it you do you generate a new state based on that so you, there, there can be a whole lot of um, physically relevant things you can do with it and i've shown you two ways how you can estimate pi to two processes and it is by no means a trivial task to understand how you should sample something because in the value involving the buffon view we were sampling between 0 and 1 uniformly while for the for the pipe problem we were or the darts problem this is also called as a darts problem we were sampling uniformly between minus 1 and 1 and for any other problem you have to really figure out as to how you will go about generating these or, or how you will describe the system in terms of a few random samples like a few sets of random samples and as to how you would set a condition to check so all that depends on the experience and your intuition well with this and this particular lecture and next time we'll look at some dynamical simulations like a uh, random box until then it's goodbye